Hey guys, Derek from Bomb Socks here with more Bomb Bites, feasting upon the words of Christ one bite at a time. The idea of imperfection is so difficult for a lot of people to understand. I remember years ago, I was I was uh, teaching at a seminary and I saw this kid in the hallway and he was sitting there just reading his scriptures and he just kind of had his face in his hands. He, he just looked so discouraged. And I just kind of walked up to him and I was like, hey, how you, how you doing? I, I thought scriptures were supposed to uplift you. And he's like, oh, yeah, they normally do, but what about this one? And he points to the Matthew 5.48 where it says, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is heaven is perfect. And uh, he just said, I can't do it. There's no way I can do it. And uh, I said, well, try this. I said, look in the footnote. And the footnote of that says, ye are therefore commanded to be perfect. And he's just like, that doesn't help. You know, now it's a commandment that I'm breaking. And I said, well, one thing to keep in mind is then I took him over to 3 Nephi chapter 12, where it does say, you know, be ye therefore perfect, even as I or your father who is in heaven is perfect. And, and I helped him understand that this perfection that you are yearning for. And again, to yearn for that perfection and yearn to be more like Christ, that's why we're here. He doesn't expect us to do it by ourselves, and he doesn't want us to. And that's part of the plan is that you are going to mess up. But understanding that you are not going to be perfect, you're not going to be perfect until you are dead and until you have a glorified, resurrected body. That is when the perfection is going to take place. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't try, but it means we should continue to try with the Savior. We can't do it without him. Perfect in Christ means you do it with him. Don't try to do it yourself because when you do it yourself, it becomes super frustrating. So one of the ones I wanted to focus on from that handout, and there are so many, I was really trying to figure out where should I go with this because, you know, there, there's so many universal things. I wanted to look at the one that I think right now may be of the most benefit. So go to 3 Nephi chapter 13 in your scriptures. Now back to this handout, it says, if you are not perfect because you are too worried about the future, right? There's so many people right now with our, the future of our, you know, the future of our country, those of you in the United States watching this, I mean, in our world in general with a, with a virus that is so volatile, depending upon when you're watching this. Um, and just with, you know, the, everything, political, um, financial, societal, so many different things out there where your future really does not look super hopeful. And so I want to take you to these verses. Go to 3 Nephi 13, and we're going to look at 25 through 34. And, and as we're reading this, and we can see a couple things that maybe might help us look at our future a little bit more hopefully. So go to verse number 25, and it says, And now it came to pass that when Jesus had spoken these words, he looked upon the twelve whom he had chosen. And he, and he had just barely taught them about, uh, you can't to serve two masters. You can choose God or choose mammon, right? the world. But you can't, uh, you can't do both. And so uh, when Jesus had spoken these words, he looked at his twelve. He said unto them, remember the words which I have spoken. For behold, ye are they whom I have chosen to minister unto this people. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life. What ye shall eat or what ye shall drink nor yet for the body, what ye shall put on, is not the life more than meat and the body more than raiment. So here's Jesus saying, look, don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're going to wear, okay? Let me help with that. Let me take care of that for you. Now, you know, that seems a little idealistic for us. You know, don't worry about your food. You know, food will just show up, you know? Someone, someone's going to door dash you every single day if you pay your tithing. No, that's not how it works. But what the Savior's trying to say is, we get so worried about the future. And understandably so. I totally get that. I'm not trying to fault you if you're worried about the future. You've done nothing wrong. But maybe there's some things here, like you look at verse 26. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither did they reap nor gather into barns. You don't see them out there, you know, freaking out about no toilet paper. You know, that's just an example. But you don't see them running to the store frantically trying to do it. Like, you don't see them doing that. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? That's an interesting statement. You can sit there and think, boy, I wish I was taller. Boom, there you go. I wish I could do this. You know, sometimes we, our minds just go crazy thinking about the way things could be. And sometimes we think that by thinking this, it'll all of a sudden change it. And we end up worrying that somehow that worry and that anxiety that we stir ourselves up with will somehow change the situation any. 28, 
And why take ye thought for raiment or your clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Like you look at Solomon, that's, that's like saying, man, Solomon was a snappy dresser. He looked great. But the lilies of the field look even better than he did. And what did they do? They didn't do anything. They just obeyed God. The elements obey God better than we do. And so they didn't sit there and stress about this and let you look at a beautiful sunset. What did that sunset do to earn that? Ah, it just kind of existed. You let God in his beautiful handiwork do what he does so well. Verse 30, wherefore? If, ye, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, even so will he clothe you, if ye are not of little faith. So there's a reason why faith is the first principle of the gospel, is we need to lead with faith. You've heard me say this, and I quoted apostles with this one. You lead with what you know. You doubt your doubts before you doubt your faith. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things, but... Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things, meaning food, clothing, everything that we, that we need to subsist in this life, shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for tomorrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient is the day unto the evil thereof. So with all of this in mind, now again, I'm not just trying to say, wake up one morning and clothes will be on you. No. There's there's this idea of just having faith in Heavenly Father, having faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a reason why that's the first principle of the gospel. I really believe, like with something like tithing, there are people out there who struggle with tithing because they're worried about where's my next meal going to come from? Where's my next paycheck? Where's my all those things like that? You put God first and all other things will fall into their proper places. I have a strong testimony that I've seen it happen in my own life. Many people out there have seen this happen. And if we could take that same philosophy into the way we're stressing about our world that we live in. So rather than stressing about money, okay, so we're stressing about our political situation. We're, we're stressing about our, our world financial situation or, or a deadly virus which is going all over the place. You put a little bit of faith into God. Trust him. And again, I'm not trying to be idealistic here. I'm trying to be optimistic and I'm trying to be faithful with this. Put some trust in him. Trust that he knows what he's doing with this. This coronavirus is not something that God is surprised about. It's not like all of a sudden he just, you know, was like, well, when did this happen? I didn't have this in my plan. He's fully aware of this and knew it was going to happen and has pr provided and will provide provisions and opportunities for us. I know there's people out there that have lost businesses. There's people that have lost homes, their livelihoods. And I get that. And that, that, that hurts my heart. But as we put a little bit of faith in God, watch how he is able to compensate. Um, one of my favorite quotes from Elder Neil A. Maxwell says, when we are perplexed and distressed, explanatory help may not always be forthcoming, but compensatory help will be. And that doesn't necessarily mean in the financial end of things, but the Lord has this wonderful compensatory nature to be able to compensate when we are overwhelmed and when we are stressed. And the future does not seem very hopeful. I love President Monson, how he said, be of good cheer. Your future is as bright as your faith. And so maybe, I, I hope that helps you out a little bit here. There, again, there's so many different places I could go with this wonderful sermon at the temple, but I, but I wanted to focus a little bit for a minute on just that idea of trusting God a little bit more and fearing our future just a little bit less. And I think as we do that, you're going to see some bright times ahead, uh, regardless of what the future looks like. So I hope that helps you out today. Uh, thanks so much for watching. Thanks for letting me be a part of your scripture study. I appreciate that. You guys are amazing. You guys are great. Have a good day and Godspeed. Bye-bye.